I request all those who are sitting at the back to please come forward and capture the seats that are vacant. Yes, the last trophy.
नमस्कार ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द इंडियन काउंसिल फॉर कल्चरल रिलेशन आई एक्सटेंड अ वॉम वेलकम टू एवरी वन गैदर हियर टूडे वी आर ऑनर टू हैव इन आर मिट्स टूडे ऑनरेबल प्रेसिडेंट आई सी सी आर डॉक्टर विनय सहस्त्र बुद्धे जी डेप्यूटी डिरेक्टर जनरल आई सी सी आर श्री अभय कुमार जी प्रोफेसर रघुवेंद्र तलवार चेयरमैन इंडियन काउंसिल ऑफ हिस्टोरिकल रिसर्च ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स एंड डिस्टिंग्विश डिग्नेटरीज once again a very warm welcome to you all today we all have gathered here to celebrate the 349th anniversary of the coronation day of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj chhatrapati shivaji maharaj the founder of maratha empire is an inspiration to all his enormous and unparalleled contribution makes him one of the leaders of the political figures of india Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj was renowned as a valorous warrior and an outstanding administrator from building a strong navy to ushering several pro people policies he was outstanding in all spheres on this note to make this evening a blessed one i invite honorable president iccr dr vinay sahasra bhute ji deputy director general iccr shri abhay kumar ji professor raghuvendra tanwar chairman indian council of historical research to join us for lighting the lamp I also request President ICCR to kindly garland the portrait of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj to pay our sincere respects. I would also request President ICCR Dr. Vinay Sahasra Bhute ji to welcome our esteemed speaker. Professor Raghuvendra Tanwar ji with a bouquet of flowers and shawl Thank you. I would also request President ICCR Dr. Vinay Sahasra Bhute ji to kindly share a few words with us on this occasion. The Chairman of the Indian Council for Historical Research, a well-known historian, a great academic. professor dr raghavendra tawar who is the chief speaker for today's evening our colleague in the iccr deputy director general shri uh, shri sorry abhay shri abhay kumar ji other uh, abhay kumar ji has recently joined so we are not very familiar about his presence on the dais always other uh, members of the staff of uh, iccr representatives of the missions 
and our dear students representing various uh, countries. It is uh, since last year that we decided to observe the uh, coronation day of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj all over the world. And while we are observing this day and celebrating and paying our tributes to Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj through this uh, special lecture today, it is being taken to various countries through live transmission via the social media. And this is important for multiple reasons. Because Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, unlike many historians, have described him, was not just a Maratha leader or a great warrior. Of course, he was a Maratha king. He belonged to Maharashtra. And he certainly was a great warrior, a strategist, a visionary. But above all, I would say that he epitomized the platonic idea of a philosopher king. He was a king, no doubt. But his motivation was not simply concerning the political power. That, of course, there was. But his passion was for the welfare of all his subjects. And in that context, I must say over here that Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, in a way, built upon the foundational understanding of India of what I describe as spiritual democracy. He was a king, but in Indian philosophy, a king is also considered as a, a person with an element of divinity, not simply to eulogize him or her, but basically remind the person who is the or monarch that he is there to perform a divine duty to take care of the subjects. And therefore, although he was a king, there are umpteen number of examples that we come across while reading his biography that he ensured that the representatives of all sections of the society are a part of his governance infrastructure. Certainly, those were the days of invasions after invasions of the invaders coming from different parts of the globe. And uh, he was fighting against those invaders. But people belonging to the communities of those invaders also were protected by him. He never considered that a way of worship could be a reason for any kind of discrimination true to the spirit of India. And therefore, uh, if we go through the way he discharged his duties as a king, we come across several examples which tell us about his deep insight about statecraft. He was a strategist, no doubt. One must give him the entire credit for uh, raising Indian naval force of his, his regime, for that matter. And he knew that uh, the sea coast of Maharashtra, Kokan, as what we call it, is vulnerable. And if we have to protect our country, we have to build a strong naval force. 
not just that but several of his instructions given through the official communication to his uh, sardars or his uh, other officials in his darbar in his court tell us that how concerned he was about the well-being of the citizens under his regime and therefore even to the minutest details we come across several letters written by him instructing his soldiers his field marshals other officials that it is our duty to take care of every single person in our kingdom and therefore in that sense i would also say that chhatrapati shivaji maharaj was also the epitome of what we call today good governance or suraj he was certainly the first freedom fighter of india a country that fought for over 300 years to free itself from the colonial rules and in that context also we come across several visionary thoughts of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj his emphasis on using our mother tongue as a language of the state craft as an official language was also very remarkable he coined several new terms which were used in the state craft while operating the kingdom at the same time the most important contribution of course we are going to hear more elaborately through a renowned scholar like uh, professor tawar but as a student of history i believe that chhatrapati shivaji maharaj contributed in a significant manner in building the confidence of the people of india that we can also win we can also defeat the invaders we can be free from the clutches of those who have established their colonies in this beautiful country and that confidence was something which was very remarkable and which was the need of the hour in a way and it was not confined only to maharashtra in a way he influenced the thinking of his times across the length and breadth of india and it is therefore that when we remember chhatrapati shivaji maharaj especially in a year when we are now going to celebrate his celebrate the 350th anniversary of his coronation in a way it is a reminder for the entire global community that we will and we can fight against the forces and successfully fight against the forces of colonialism because today colonialism is not just confined to who rules where it has also in a way made deep inroads into our culture our civilizational values and there are people who are through whatever the strength they have trying to influence the global culture and in a way trying to flatten the world same kind of culture everywhere same kind of uh, lifestyle everywhere this is also a different kind of colonialism that the entire global community is experiencing and therefore to rekindle the flame of confidence that we can fight against these forces of colonialism it is essential it is critical it is important to remember the life and mission of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj it is for this that the indian council for cultural relations decided to observe this day and pay tributes to this great son of bharat mata i am happy dr tawar accepted our request and he is here to explain us about the contribution of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj i thank him at the outset welcome you all and 
I am sure while paying tributes to Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, we will also be inspired and greatly motivated to fight against the forces of a new kind of colonialism. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your kind remarks. As we all celebrate the 349th anniversary of the coronation day of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, it is important to recall his contribution. And for this, today we have with us Professor Raghuvendra Tanwarji to deliver a lecture on contribution of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj in the history of India. I would now like to take this opportunity to introduce him. Prof Professor Raghuvendra Tanwar is chairman of the Indian Council of Historical Research, New Delhi, since January 2022, and also the chairman of the Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi. Professor Tanwar is a Padma Shri. He has an outstanding academic record with two gold medals at the postgraduate level for standing first class first MA history and for securing the highest percentage of marks in the Faculty of Social Sciences. He joined as a lecturer of history subject at the Kurukshetra University in August 1977 and was selected as Professor Open Selection in 1997. He superannuated from service in February 2015. He was honored by the university with the position of Professor Emeritus in 2015. He was also the director of the Haryana Academic Academy of History and Culture, which is an autonomous body of the government of Haryana. He is reputed for his contribution to the study of partition of India, mainly the Punjab, and for his work on the history of Jammu and Kashmir in the critical phase of 1947 and 1953. Professor Tanwar's latest study in the year 2021, The Story of India's Partition, has been published by the Publication Division of the Government of India in English and Hindi. He has also edited five volume study of the speeches and writings of Punjab's legendary peasant leader, Sir Chotu Ram. His other publications include a well received monograph, Introduction to Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. And a, comp and a compilation of articles written for national newspapers titled, Frankly Speaking. He has been a national fellow of the UGC Research Awardee, an awardee of the UGC Major Research Project, and a Foreign Travel Awardee of the Indian Council of Historical Research. <laughs> Professor Tanwar has for many decades been associated with several educational institutions with focus on rural areas and women's education. He is well-known sportsman, having cap captained the university and the Haryana State Lawn Tennis Team. With this brief introduction, please join me in welcoming Professor Raghuvendra Tanwar. Dr. Vinay uh, Sasrabudeji, am I audible? Is the system? Yeah. Just take the mic. It's okay? Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Abhay Kumar, my friend, uh, Meeta Lothanji, Secretary of Youth, Government of India, distinguished guests from the, uh, the diplomatic missions, students, and uh, friends from the Indian Council of Cultural Relations. When Dr. Veneji first referred this lecture to me, uh, honestly, I was a bit hesitant. Uh, having spent about 50 years working on Kashmir and partition, I thought Veneji was making a mistake in offering this prestigious lecture to me. However, the chance to speak at the ICCR was welcome, and I'm greatly honored to be here. Uh, I must earnestly thank you for the same. You know, when we think of Shivaji, so actually so much has been written on him. I'll be focusing on some key points, uh, explaining things that uh, not normally we are conversant with. We've had research done in Persian, Sanskrit, Marathi, French, and of course English. So you have a huge amount of corpus of uh, 
literature available on Shivaji. Now, why does he stand out in, why should we be meeting here, celebrating, commemorating his 349th coronation day? Uh, Shivaji is a portrait, is a name. Virtually every household in India, you will find his portrait in a school, in some primary school, colleges, homes. It is universal. So there are reasons for this, why this has happened. <clears throat> To begin with, the most important thing is that, as uh, Dr. Sab said, Dr. Vinayji said, that he awakened an element of national pride. Now, when we talk of national pride, when we talk of invasions, you see, India is a evolutionary civilization. We are not a nation that has been created by a drawing of maps or a political treaty, or sudden, you know, you just the war is finished, and so you have three new nations. India has evolved over five thousand years, ten thousand years. And we've grown up with ages. Uh, we are a living civilization. Some of what we do today, we were doing 5,000 years ago. So every step has evolved. In this context, during the course of this lecture, when I refer to, say, Hindu pride or Muslim pride, uh, you know, today India is a home for everyone. And so we are talking of the, in history, it's very important to understand the period specific. So when you talk of pride, when you talk of an invasion, when you talk of an invader, when you talk of, when you refer to a Muslim or a Hindu, you are not talking of the 21st century. You are talking of the 17th century, the 16th century. This is how the world was. So this is, I just want to preface myself before I come down. <clears throat> now, the 6th of June is a very historic day in the chronological history of the evolutionary history of India in the sense that it is the day when Shivaji was, the process for coronation started on the 6th. It went on for many days, some say for many months, but the coronation itself was completed on the 16th of June. Now, there was an Englishman who was present in the court of Shivaji on this particular day. He has left an account of this, and G.S. Saradasai, another authority who has done a lot of work on Shivaji, cites from it. He says there were 50,000 people present when the coronation was done. Shivaji was weighed in gold. His weight was around 140 pounds. And so these are the kind of stories that you have of this and most importantly, uh, the entire rituals were done by a system which was 2,500 years by the Vedic rituals. So the importance of Shivaji's coronation must also be seen in the context of how his coronation was conducted. So we have details of how these uh, rituals are conducted. So this is precisely what I've been saying, that the evolutionary civilization that, we, uh, that India is, is symbolic in the coronation of Shivaji in this sense. Now, the Hindu character of Shivaji, again, as I, I'm, let me re-emphasize on that, uh, please uh, take this in the context of the 17th century. You know, this is the whole world. I mean, if you look at what is happening in Europe and what is happening here, so you have to compare the world of the 16th, 17th century. So the Hindu character of Shivaji's coronation, the Hindu character of the vision that he has for Swarajya is very, very important for us to understand in the overall understanding, the overall imprint of Shivaji's uh, coronation. As uh, Dr. Venerji just said, <clears throat> uh, he introduced an Indianness into the administration. To begin with, he replaced Persian, Urdu with Marathi, Sanskrit. We even have a dictionary for running the affairs of the state. And this we are talking of 1670s. So you have this kind of system that he's evolving in uh, you know, the, the resurgent spirit that he's introducing here. Sardasai quotes from a court historian of Shivaji. Uh, just to give you an idea of what is the kind of environment, what is the kind of uh, feeling that is prevailing at the time of Shivaji's coronation in the year 1674. I'm reading from this. Why should we remain content with what the Muslim rulers choose to give us? We are Hindus. Again, you see, this context is 17th century. The whole country is asked by right and yet it is occupied and held by foreigners. The context of foreigners is because Shivaji is visualizing this country as, uh, as a country, you know, I'll come to this a bit later, not in terms of political, he's looking at it as a spiritual kind of unity. They disrespect our temples, demolish our holy idols, convert us forcibly, carry away our women. We will suffer this treatment no more. We possess strength in our arms. Let us draw the sword in defense of our sacred religion, liberate our country. There is no such thing as good luck or ill luck. So this is the kind of spirit that Shivaji's court is talking of in the year 1674. Now, when you place the year 1674, you must understand uh, this is, you know, the, the, the Mughal Empire is 
going towards its end. You have several names emerging at this context in our history. You have Pratap who has preceded Shivaji about 70, 80 years. You have Guru Govind who is emerging in the north. So this is a resurgent kind of period where uh, there is opposition to alien rule, opposition to foreign rule. So Shivaji alone is not standing here. The names that I just took, Maharana Pratap or even Guru Govind, these are household portraits in India today. So this process is actually starting in the 17th century, this opposition to... Uh, <clears throat> Dadunath Sarkar is another very eminent historian of medieval Indian history. He too quotes, he too emphasizes on the same point. He set an example of innate Hindu capacity, which would continue to fire the spirit of man. This is Jadunath Sarkar. Sarkar also writes, he goes back another few hundred years. He says, after the 1193 defeat of in Taran, when Prithviraj Chauhan was defeated, so you have this, uh, this new trend. He says, after all that period, you have another ruler who's talking in that term. Wave after wave of foreign onset had swept over the Hindu world. No Hindu had ever raised his head above the flood of Muslim conquest. Thus, when 1659-60, he refers to Shivaji as a poor young boy, uh, a friendless youth of 32, set himself to face the might of the Mughal Empire. He seemed to be the maddest of all madmen. In 14 years, he founded a state that has sustained itself for so long. This is Jaduna Sarkar's assessment of Shivaji. A 32-year-old man, he calls him a madman, thinking of em emancipation at that time, he calls, he sees, must be the maddest of madmen. <clears throat> now, the India that you have in the 17th century, Europe is creeping out of poverty. You know, Europe, you know, we all, most of you must be familiar what is happening in Europe. From a GDP, from being almost 34% of the GDP in 1000 AD, which India was, in a few hundred years, we go down to 1%. So it, the whole role is being reversed. India is being seen as a, an ideal potential candidate for being colonized. From, say, 34% of GDP in 1080, uh, a few hundred years of colonial rule, we come down to less than 1%. So this is the kind of environment that is prevailing in the 17th century India. <clears throat> now, when you look at Shivaji, he swims against the historical tide, the historical process. He is surrounded by Aurangzeb on one side, the Pathans, the Abyssinians, the Portuguese have come in. There is a huge, you see, again, uh, without meaning anything, and the point is when you talk of the 17th, 16th century, you're talking of a massive wave of conversions, religious wars, which are spilling into the subcontinent. You have East India Company, you have the Portuguese on the east, on the west coast, you have the Abyssinians, the Pathans. So he is swimming against that tide. This is the kind of... Uh, Difficulty. This is the kind of uh, opposition that he is facing at this particular time. <clears throat> Shivaji is seeking a Hindu empire at a time when it was unthinkable. J. Sardasai writes a detailed note on this. What were the difficulties that he is having at this time? Now, it's very important to understand Shivaji's perspective of what kind of empire he wants here. I'm quoting from Sardasai. <clears throat> Religious freedom could not be obtained without political power. And to that extent, he exerted himself in the freeing his homeland from Muslim control. He proved, by example, that the Hindu race can build a nation, found a state, defeat enemies, conduct their own defense, protect and promote literature and art, commerce and industry, maintain navies and ocean trading fleets. He taught the modern Hindu to rise to the full stature of his growth. Shivaji has shown that the tree of Hinduism is not really dead, that it can rise from beneath the seemingly crushing load of centuries of political bondage, that it can put forth new leaves and branches. This is J.S. Sardasai on Shivaji's importance in the context of Indian history. Now, see, when you look at the, as I said, I started, as I started with a reference to uh, a civilization that has evolved, perhaps the single most important contribution of Shivaji uh, must be seen in the context of how he brought culture and spiritualism to center stage. This is a trend that you find for centuries later. I'll come back towards the end of this lecture. I'll explain to you why he's important today. Because he brings to center stage the concept of cultural and spiritualism. This nation has always been, I was very happy to listen to Dr. Vene when he referred to spiritual democracy. This is a fascinating concept. And this is what we have always been. So this concept of culture and spiritualism in political 
and in governance, in political expansion is very, very significant. Shivaji was intensely religious, but nothing would be further from the truth than to imagine that Shivaji was anti-Muslim. Some of his finest commanders, his navy commanders, his court, his, his confidential secretary, the entire court system had very important people looking after they were all Muslim. And they were so this this concept that you know the Hindu, it was the Hindu Muslim context, this does not exist in the context of Shivaji. When you look at his personal profile in a lecture like this, I would not be able to go into detail too much. But the fact is that he was a completely egalitarian kind of attitude. He was completely secular in that sense. And he valued merit. He valued good people irrespective of from where they came, what religious faith they belonged to. Sarkar points out, uh, Dadunath Sarkar makes a very important reference, saying how relevant Shivaji is to our present times. He says, and the point he raises is, political ideals were such that we can accept them, even today, almost without a change. 1674, to when, this, when Sarkar did this work, it was the 1950s. He aimed at giving his subjects peace, universal toleration, equal opportunity, a beneficent and active system of administration, a navy for protecting trade, and a militia for protecting the borders. Now, this is any good governance would think on the same lines even today. So, Shivaji is talking of it 300 years, more than 300 years ago. He had an eight member cabinet. He was the first ruler of the time who disconnected the political, the, the military administration from the civil administration, the Jagir Dari system which actually was that you uh, give someone land, he, he will give you back soldiers. He dis dealing them. This was complete, uniquely, it was a unique concept at that time. Shivaji was very simple and very, his style, you know, this age, the 70s, the 16th century, 17th century, you have a lot of pomp, pageantry, debauchery, and all kinds of courts are rotten to the root. So here is a man who lives a very uh, simple life, straight life. He's living a very, he's a devoted son, a devoted uh, you know, uh, husband and very earnest towards women. He looks at, so a lot of things can be said here. He is among the first rulers to understand the Western psyche. He had a very negative perception of the West. He says they are intriguers, they are bribe givers, they don't do honest business, they cheat us, yet they are powerful. Why are they powerful? talks of the navies. So Shivaji is the first person who actually thinks of having a naval power. The navy he creates is laughed at at first. It's a very small, small ships. But Shivaji had a design to that. He said the Konkan coast requires small ships. So he has this kind of, he builds 500 ships, 250 ports on the coast. So he protects for so 40 years. The empire is protected against the English and against the Portuguese. Now, uh, when you try to understand Shivaji in a, in a more general kind of manner, uh, what are the qualities that really enabled him to rise to such an extent? The most profound quality was his ability to judge character. This every historian who has done work on him has come out with this. He says he has this unique ability to judge people. He has this unique ability to know the limits of his, 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 his power or his governance. My army can go so far, far uh, so far, and you know the limits of his uh, his administrative acumen, the limits of his treasury. So he's a very practical kind of man. He does not go beyond a limit. He does not overstretch himself. So to understand Shivaji's success, two key points: his emphasis on merit, his emphasis on an uh, kind of non-sectarian approach, and of course a practical approach to understanding that. These are the limits of what my government can do. Uh, you see, a practical in the sense, he is aware, for example, <clears throat> when he realizes <clears throat> that his main enemies are, of course, the armies of foreign Zeb, he does not give it a religious form. He knows that if I give it a religious form, you will have all the armies combining. So he gives it a nationalistic character. 
He does not. He knows that once I give it a religious character, there is no way I can win the war. So this is his vision. This is his foresight. This is the manner in which he is handling these difficult times. <clears throat> Now, when you look at the Europeans at the time, see, for Shivaji, it was you had enemies at home. You had enemies looking at India as a colonial prospect. So you have to take a call on how do you manage this. So his diplomacy, the manner in which he interacts with you have foreigners coming into his courts and uh, the manner he's keeping them at bay, the priorities that he's establishing are also very, very important in understanding the overall success that he is achieving here. Now, I referred to Maharana Pratap in the beginning of this lecture. The 16th century, Maharana Pratap, of course, is a contemporary of Akbar. And you have Shivaji, first Maharana Pratap, then you have Shivaji, then of course, you have Guru Gobind soon after. Now, these are three very fascinating characters of the 16th and 17th century. All of them have, of course, the 10th Guru is a very revered name in, uh, in, in history. And he is, of course, personified by the Sikh faith. So, but there is something else that joins the three together. They are all standing against an alien. The concept of imagining India as one. We are not a politically united country or politically united nation. Uh, say in the 17th century. But Shivaji is visualizing something else. He is visualizing this country in the context of its spiritual and cultural unity. That is the same spirit you find in Pratap, you find in Shivaji and of course in Guru Gobind. This is very important for us to understand this spirit. When Akbar, when, you know, when Akbar was in court, I'll just give you an anecdotal reference here to make you understand the importance of these two characters. Akbar's court was in, uh, in sitting, and the news reached that Pratap had been, has, Pratap has passed away. Uh, there was a Rajput Bad. Rajput Bad means those who sit in the court who, who, who tell tales in the court. So there is this Rajput Bad, uh, Dursa, and he writes, he writes, it is quoted by Nancy, you attained a very high place in the world. On hearing of your death of Pratap, 19 June 1597, Akbar's eyes were dimmed and his tongue stuck in his throat. Now, saying something like this, that the emperor's eyes were stuck and his tongue was stuck in the throat, the whole court, Nancy describes the scene, the whole court was wonderstruck. And uh, Akbar gets up and he rewards Dursa. He says, what you have said is right. When Aurangzeb heard of Shivaji's death, this is what he said. This is 30th April, 1680. Uh, Aurangzeb. He was a great captain and the only one who has had the magnanimity to raise a new kingdom. While I have been endeavoring to destroy the ancient sovereignties of this country, my armies have been employed against him for 19 years, and yet his state keeps going. It is still expanding. So this is the compliment that Aurangzeb is paying Shivaji on Shivaji's death. So this is the kind of uh, <clears throat> the importance. Now, coming to the last phase, <clears throat> And which, of course, is the most important in the present context. The freedom movement, you know, as uh, Dr. Veneji referred, the colonial rule, the oppressive nature of the colonial rule, we have different phases. In the 19th century, uh, towards the middle of the 19th century, of course, we have our first war of independence. Uh, towards after the 1857 incidents, you have a new concept of uh, writings emerging in nationalist historiography. You have Bankim Chandra referring to the nation as a mother. You have Tilak referring to the nation as a mother. You have Aurobindo referring to the nation as a mother. You have Vinayak Savarkar referring to the nation as a mother. Where is this concept of mother come? Tilak, of course, directly ascribes it to Shivaji. Shivaji is, becomes the focal point of a parallel movement. In Indian story, in Indian in, in the uh, narrative of the freedom movement, you have two streams. One stream presents the story 
as a story which was politically inspired, political movements, political achievements. The story that has gone unreported, to which we are now drawing attention, is the story that it was actually a cultural and spiritual revolutionary movement. So this inspiration to the national movement, to the freedom movement, has actually been contributed by Shivaji, and all of them are following it. Ravindranath Tagore makes a reference to Shivaji. I'm quoting from him. When did this thought light up your bro? Under one dharma, the scattered lands of Bharat shall I unite together into one. This is Tagore. Tagore is visualizing Shivaji's actions as someone who's trying to unite this country. There's a gap of over 200 years. So Ravindranath Tagore refers to Shivaji Shivaji's attempts as someone trying to unite. The nationalist writings of the early 20th century, late 19th century, invariably they draw their inspiration from Shivaji. Because he has interwoven the entire process of his fight against alien rule in the guise of, in, in the cloaks of, uh, say, spiritualism, culture, and national pride, which goes back thousands of years. See, Shivaji's perception of Indian pride is not limited to political boundaries. Over two centuries after Shivaji, another great son, the sage philosopher Aurobindo, I'll be citing from Aurobindo, <clears throat> uh, whose 150th anniversary we are celebrating this year. Aurobindo writes, and look at the similarity. Why I'm referring it? Because you can catch the similarity. I'm quoting from Aurobindo. India, shut into a separate existence by the Himalayas and the ocean, has always been the home of a peculiar people with characteristics of its own recognizably distinct from others, with its own distinct civilization, way of life, way of the spirit, a separate culture, arts, building of society. It has absorbed all that has entered into it, put upon all the Indian stamp, welded the most diverse elements into one. This is Aurobindo. This is precisely what Shivaji is talking. Aurobindo describes uh, nationhood, nationalism. What is a nation? What is our mother country? It is not a piece of earth, not speech, nor a fiction of the mind. It is mighty Shakti, composed of the Shaktis of all millions of units that make up the nation. The Shakti we call India, Bhavani Bharti, is the living unity of 300 million people. 300 million, obviously, at that time. Now, when you look at these statements of people like Aurobindo, I'll close with the, with the oath of the Abhinav Bharat, uh, which was given to members of the secret society founded in 1904. <clears throat> Shivaji's land where he worked, very, uh, you know, Vinayak Savarkar, you must, uh, those of you who are familiar, <clears throat> when Mitra Mela was a secret society, it was renamed as Abhinav Bharat in 1904. And uh, the oath that was to be taken by the members who joined the Abhinav Bharat is something that you should really hear out. Vande Matram, salutations to the mother. In the name of God, in the name of Bharat Mata. In the name of all the martyrs that have shed their bloods for Bharat Mata. By the love innate in all men and women that are bare to the land of my birth. Wherein lie the sacred ashes of my forefathers and which is the cradle of my children by the tears of the countless mothers for their children, whom the foreigner has enslaved, imprisoned, tortured, and killed, convinced that with, without absolute political independence or swarajya, my country can never rise to the exalted position among the nations. Earth, which is her due, and convinced also that the swarajya can never be attained except by the waging of a bloody and relentless war. Now, this is Savarkar in 1904. If you look at it carefully, this is the whole process of thought that actually takes its first form in the times of Shivaji. And it comes right down to the present times. Uh, I'll close with this general idea here that uh, as Viniji just referred, that the term democracies, you know, the spiritual democracy, 
we've just inaugurated our new parliament and you will be so happy to see the manner in which thousands of years of indian history stand depicted in this parliament and these are ideas that have been generated over ages that have evolved over ages we've had different phases in our fight for freedom we've had the but the continuity of the process you have these names figuring again and again and again after every 100 200 years the chain goes on so uh, the name of shivaji is reverent because he was as relevant in the 17th century as he is today uh, with these words i'll uh, thank you for listening to me very patiently it has been a great honor speaking from this platform and uh, i'm sure the 350th anniversary that comes start this year is going to be a much grander event uh, thank you once again thank you sir for this insightful session and as rightly emphasized from savarkar tilak to arubindo chhatrapati shivaji maharaj's enormous contribution continues to inspire generations to come with this I would like to invite uh, Deputy Director General ICC R Sri Abhay Kumar Ji for a vote of thanks. Namaste. Good evening. I have this honor of thanking Professor Tamwar for his enlightening talk. about chhatrapati shivaji maharaj uh, there are lots of students here from africa i see and i just wanted to bring out this interesting fact that one of the great sons of africa malik ambar who was the de facto ruler of ahmednagar and a very powerful prime minister he was in fact he started his journey from abyssinia in modern day ethiopia but he became he came to india and he became a very powerful ruler and one person whom jahangir truly detested was malik ambar because Malik Ambar stood as a wall between the north Mughal north and south uh, the sultanates of the south and also this interesting fact that the grandfather of Maharaj Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj was employed by malik ambar malik ambar was also responsible for building the fort of janjira and some of you should go and see that and bringing out these facts i wanted to to make this this connection that connection very interesting i was just uh, also going through the contributions i mean the the politics of that time and uh, shivaji maharaj was a very very astute strategist he was not only uh, only working he he was making alliances wherever possible i see some ambassadors here and uh, i would like to to recommend uh, to you all of you to read uh, i think his his uh, the strategy of shivaji maharaj how did he survive uh, that period and not only survived but excelled i would like to thank uh, professor tanwar and president iccr uh, and all of you 
for finding time to 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 join us together for this beautiful evening to to commemorate uh shivaji's cor coronation thank you all thank you sir and thanks again to everyone uh with this we have now come towards the end of the program uh, all distinguished delegates and all the students are requested to join us for high tea in the conference room thank you But I don't know how to end this. Like if I press something and I don't want to like screw this for him.